Before we begin, let's talk about Nesty. Nesty Pateshwa said in her early days of boxing, she literally only did it because it was the only way she could bring home food for her family. Years later, at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, she punched her way to a silver and dedicated her historic win to the LGBTQ community. Her statement almost felt like a direct echo against Manny Pacquiao, an idol within her same sport, who once justified being against same-sex marriage by saying, if men mate with men and women mate with women, they are worse than animals. It is not a question that Petesho, an open lesbian, has likely experienced discrimination all her life. Like her fellow medal winner Heidelin Diaz, she has been called unfeminine and called out for participating in an unfeminine sport. Outside her career as a boxer, we can expect that she has experienced all the verbal assault and emotional violence that the LGBTQ are often vulnerable to in the still hyper-Catholic, hyper-conservative Philippines. That in 2021, she stood up there in front of the press and dedicated this victory to those marginalized for their sex and sexual orientation was brave and must not be forgotten. Hello there, history enthusiast or otherwise bored person, and thanks for giving us a listen. My name is Sunny, and this is Yugto, a podcast where we get mad about Philippine history. In the spirit of Nesty's bravery and her ability to defy the odds and be unapologetically her on the biggest sports stage in the world, today's reason to be mad is how shit Filipino sports and the sports world in general treats athletes who do not conform to their gender norms. Now I'm going to be transparent. This episode is a bit of a cheat. Back in 2020, I produced five episodes for the original run of Yugto, before my wonderful team at Whip Inc. came on board and allowed me to reconsider my approach towards the whole thing. Of the five episodes I produced alone at the time, there was one that seemed to strike a chord in a particular way with our listeners. This was the story of Mona Sulaiman and Nancy Navalta. The tale of how these two athletes and the gender discrimination that they had to suffer and sacrifice their sports career for was the last episode released before Yugto's big redo. But it was also the second most listened to episode. We will save Nancy Navalta's life for another time. Today, we will be revisiting Mona Sulaiman's side of the story. Maybe you remember Mona's tale. Possibly you listened to the original episode when we had it up then. If you did, then I invite you to re-listen, to dip your toes back into what made the whole thing so terrible, and spoke to horrible gender biases that still exist today as we just saw in the recent Finnish Tokyo Olympics. Or maybe you don't remember her story. Maybe this is your first time hearing of Mona Sulaiman, once Asia's racing queen. If you haven't, then buckle up. Because this is going to be a hell of a run all the way to the finish line. You cannot talk of Philippine sports without mentioning her name. She was almost unbeatable. It is 1942. The person whose words these were spoken about is born. She is the daughter of a Muslim policeman and his wife, and to be eldest of five siblings. Her name is Mona Sulaiman. Before the rest of her siblings are even born, Mona is obsessed with running. At the Cotobato Elementary School she attends, she runs 100 and 200 meter competitions at the age of seven, when she was barely in the first grade. Anecdotally, she would run these competitions against people in her school as old as 13. Imagine being at the cusp of puberty and finding that a kid half your size can run as fast as you. It might have been annoying for her competitors, but her teachers and scouts in the local area took note. Mona has natural talent coming out of her ears. Mona Sulaiman is in the fifth grade and actually focusing on softball when she is officially asked to try out 
for regional games. Someone from the local Bureau of Public Schools goes to watch one of her games and sees that the rumors are true. How fast this stocky, dark-skinned, curly-haired girl runs from base to base is borderline ridiculous. The official approaches her after the game and asks if she might be interested in running against youth from other regions. And of course, Mona is. This becomes Mona's first taste of proper training. She finally has a coach and financial sponsorship from the higher-ups who scouted her. It's a bit jarring to adjust to this new environment, since Mona is used to pretty much freewheeling the way she wants and is used to running barefoot. But as she becomes open to the formal aspects of running, Mona quickly becomes properly unbeatable. First in her local district, then in the surrounding areas. At a national scholastic meet in Lingayen, a coach from the Far Eastern University, or FEU, recruits Mona, now much bemedaled and a staple at podiums. For a 15-year-old from Tumultuas Mindanao, getting to go to a major university in the bustling capital of Metro Manila, simply due to her ability to sprint, was no small deal. And for sure, the FEU knew that. It is a win-win situation. FEU would have an international-level sprinter who could bring home medals they could brag about. Mona would be able to study management and still run while being exposed to even better training than before. By this point, Mona has been known in the media for years by a specific moniker, one that evokes her uniqueness and innocence underlying her projectile-esque speed. They call her the Barefoot Muslim Girl. It is the 1960 Olympics. The games are in Rome. An 18-year-old Mona is overseas for the first time. Her 130-pound frame standing next to the best of the world's best of running. Still stocky and dark-skinned, Mona gives it her all in the 100-meter and 200-meter dash. She makes it to the quarterfinals of the former. Not bad at all for a girl who has only been formally training for the Olympics for three years. She's barely on the cusp of womanhood for crying out loud. When she flies back home, and the press asks her what it was like, she says that she is now several times richer in experience. It is easy to assume she has also become several times richer in ambition. With the next Olympics a concrete goal to aspire to, Mona begins to rely less on her natural talent and the way that she has taught herself to run. In doing so, she better appreciates the techniques, the coaching, the best-case practices. Her training regimens become more comprehensive. This approach works. In the 1962 qualifying Asian Games, Mona breaks several records, metaphorically without breaking a sweat. She became the first person ever to win double golds in running and the first Filipina to win three golds in a single year at any Asian Games. The fact that she won a bronze medal for a shot put event, because yes, Suleiman still found time to be super good at other sports, being the natural that she was, was just the cherry on top of the cake. Newspapers around the world talk about the never-before-done feats she executes at these games, and she becomes an international media and sponsorship darling. Mona Suleiman is now a veritable sensation in the sports world. A runner who is locking 10.6 seconds for the 100-meter sprint, just 0.33 seconds off of the world's record at the time. She is no longer the barefoot Muslim girl. She is now being dubbed Asia's Sprint Queen. It is extra disappointing then, when those same 1964 Tokyo Olympics roll around and Suleiman falters. Perhaps it is because of all the media attention, the overwhelming expectation from her countrymen, or just plain overconfidence. Whatever the reason, she does not even qualify for the final heats of her events. 
she was expected to make a splash. But all the attention ends up going to Anthony Villanueva, boxing his way to the first Filipina silver medal, whose story we covered in the last episode. After all those years of investment, the loss weighs heavy on her for sure. But at least back in her home turf, Suleiman still comfortably outperforms her peers. Despite her disappointing second Olympics, she continues to break records and turn heads. She runs 11.9 seconds in the 100-meter dash, safely beating the time of then-dubbed Queen of Running, Innocentia Solis, and also breaks the national record for the shot put. No big deal. A discus athlete and Mona Spear, Romeo Soto, observes the following at the time. Innocentia Solis was the smoother sprinter, but Mona the more powerful runner. This power, the same thing that characterizes her and carries her to great heights, ironically, would be the same cause of Mona Suleiman's downfall. It is 1966, the Asian Games approach. It is an arena Suleiman has won at countless times, and that she will have to win it again if she wants to represent Asia in the 1968 Olympics. It is expected that making it to the podium will not be an issue for her. There is another completely different problem, though, and one that no one sees coming. People are questioning if Mona is a woman. Let's wind it back. At one point in a competition leading up to the Asian Games, Mona is asked to take a gender test. To everyone's surprise, Mona categorically and adamantly refuses. It seems invasive, but it is also a routine ask, so officials aren't sure what the big deal is. And so inevitably, the refusal spurs rumor. What if she didn't want to take it because she was you know, not a woman. A sort of vitriol begins to rise from those who envied her success, or who were always critical of her because of her lack of training. There were whispers. No wonder she's so muscular, no wonder she's so unfeminine, no wonder she seems so naturally gifted, and no wonder she can run faster and throw harder than any girl. Because she isn't one. Why did Suleiman refuse to take the sex test? As far as official narratives go, over the years there have been two stories that originated from Mona herself. One was that the very idea of a sex test was against Mona's Islamic beliefs. The other was that she was sick and feeling unwell, and the idea of the sex test made it work. Either way, Mona's team backs her up. They say the narrative of Suleiman rejecting the sex test as something that was telling about her gender or sex was being circulated on purpose by people bitter about how talented she was. They are adamant that Suleiman has identified as and been identified by others as a girl since she was spotted that day on the softball field a decade ago. They ask if this sex test has any actual necessity outside of humiliating her. Of course, this only made the opposing camps whisper even more. What reason would she have to continue to be so against it, especially if it was robbing her of chances to actually compete? Sure enough, official sports bodies begin banning Suleiman from competition. Just until she agrees to the sex test, of course. It becomes clear that the sex test was a make or break point. Suleiman could either take the test, or bow out of her chance to represent the country in the next Olympics. Suleiman is at the end of her rope. Her mental health frays at the edges. Suddenly, the excited crowds were whispering behind her back. Suddenly, missives from once adoring fans were replaced by invasive questions about what she has between her legs, and threats of violence. Suddenly, the media locally and abroad that had called her the fastest woman in Asia were now calling her a potential fraud and cross-dresser. Her head coach, 
Roberto Evangelista tried to shield her from all of this. Thank God that social media didn't exist then, or she really would have found the hate inescapable. But even then, it is impossible for Evangelista to completely keep her away from all the discourse. Papers printed questions of whether she was a man, published against pictures of the macho frame she had worked hard all her life to maintain. Tabloids used language that was even less kind. Mona spirals, especially as a Muslim, a religion more conservative about these sorts of affairs. The scrutiny becomes unbearable. Why is her talent and training being tossed aside? in favor of the question of whether she had a secret penis or not. And while social media didn't exist, fake news and making uninformed opinions did. Audiences become convinced by these pictures even without the test results that she must have been cross-dressing this whole time just to win medals and money. There is now growing public anger at what is perceived to be Suleiman's audacity. Suleiman receives more and more threats, and she becomes increasingly withdrawn and paranoid. She even begins carrying a gun around with her, afraid one of the many random threats of violence against her would follow through. The humiliation and the insult of being forced into gender verification tests, just to compete in the 1966 Asian Games specifically, ends up being the last straw. There is too much embarrassment, too much venom. Everything is tainted now. Suleiman bows out, not just out of the competition, but out of the sport entirely. Mona throughout her life continues to say she misses sports. Perhaps there is a world where she bounces back after this whole horrible scandal. Perhaps there is a world where Mona goes on to her third Olympic Games, becoming what everyone hoped she might have been then, the first Filipino Olympic gold medalist. But alas, the world we live in is cruel. An accident in the 80s permanently benches Asia's once racing queen. For the rest of her life, Mona Suleiman never runs again. Suleiman takes on various jobs after graduating in forced retirement. A checker, a staff assistant to a local film producer, an owner of a grocery, a manager of beer gardens, a consultant, even a bit player who appeared in several films. Eventually, she becomes a consultant for the Philippine Sports Commission. In this time, Suleiman finds a level of peace and happiness. Her husband is a coach as well. She bears children that she loves, thereby answering a question that everyone had now stopped asking. She retained some of the lofty friendships she made when she was the sports world's darling, including a questionable one with the Marquises. But still, she misses sports. In 2017, Suleiman passes away at the age of 75. Just the year before, she was personally inducted into the Philippine Sports Commission Hall of Fame. She accepted her medal in a wheelchair to resounding applause from people who represented those same institutions who once shunned her for refusing to prove by their standards that she was a woman. To this day, she remains the only Filipino athlete to ever win three gold medals in one Asian Games. The fact that Suleiman was treated thus because of the way she looked does not speak well of the way our country treats women. Not long after her, Nancy Navalta, who was hailed as being the second coming of Lydia de Vega and was similarly dubbed the queen of female runners in the Philippines during her peak, was cherry-picked to be sex-tested because of the way that she looked. Navalta turned out to be intersex, and since no one knew how to handle that, she was dropped out of competitions altogether. This phenomenon is not exclusive to the Philippines. Players as lofty as living legend Serena Williams are questioned regularly by online trolls purely because their physique is judged to be masculine-leaning or just generally unfeminine. You might have also heard about the scandal of women 
being banned from the athletics events at the Tokyo Olympics because they had too much of the hormone testosterone in their body. Let me quote this article from Forbes. Christine Mboma and Beatrice Masilingi of Namibia were banned from participating in the 400-meter race due to their natural high testosterone levels. The two runners can still participate in the 200 meters because track's testosterone rules only apply to longer distance races. In other words, the pair qualify as female, depending on how far they are running. In the first place, these archaic gender tests only came to be because some people, including and notably Adolf Hitler, would send actual men into women's sports categories so that they could win. This had nothing to do with how those athletes identified. This was being done maliciously, consciously. But over time, gender tests just got distorted, now to include testosterone and all sorts of hormones bullshit. At the end of the day, discriminating based on hormones is just a roundabout way of putting what women and men are into very neat and small boxes. That's, generally speaking, advantageous to a Western heteronormative point of view. Don't even get me started on the fact that to begin with, the athletes were being pointed at and being made to be tested, primarily because of the way that they looked or the way their body was built. It's a lot to dissect, but we're running out of time and I'm already heated about this, enough as it is. So feel free to yell at me in emails or comments if you want to debate it, because I'm all ears. Suffice it to say that Mona Sulaiman is a legend, despite all the humiliation she had to face. She broke records, she became an Olympian, and at the end of the day, she didn't allow herself to be boxed in, belittled, or humiliated. She knew that it was the Philippines that's lost, that she wouldn't be able to display her greatest talent on the world stage. To be honest, to this day, we rightly mourn those losses, because after all, don't we lose every race we don't run? This episode, we remember Mona Sulaiman. And we are mad on behalf of any athlete who has ever lost any opportunity because of sexual and gender discrimination. Here's to hoping that the future is more inclusive than the past. Thank you for listening. If you're interested in hearing more stories about the local Filipino sports scene, why not listen to Go Hard Girls, a podcast about breaking records and breaking barriers. Learn all about the different female sports legends of the Philippines by listening to Go Hard Girls on Spotify. Yugto is narrated, researched, and written by Sunny, and is supported by the Work in Progress team, or WIP Inc. Sources and any subsequent corrections of facts for this episode can be found on the website. Support the Yugto podcast on Spotify, Anchor, and YouTube, or email us any questions at whipinc.ph at gmail.com. Finally, help us get these stories out there by sharing us on Twitter at yugto underscore pod, on Instagram at yugto.pod, or on Facebook at yugto.pod. Join us next week for another episode about the history of Filipino sports. And remember, activism is not terrorism, truth is not terrorism, and don't waste your vote this coming May. See you next time!